Bugle, audio newspaper for a visual world. Hello Buglers, I am Andy Zaltzman, it is Friday the 8th of May 2020 and this is issue 4152 of the Bugle audio newspaper for a viral world and exciting news just breaking, the UN has just passed Security Council Resolution 2519 declaring that the year is 1999 again and the world is going to be allowed another swing at the 21st century and with it of course the third millennium uh, which uh, historians have recently claimed was the rubbishest start to a millennium on record. Uh, so that's, uh, that's good news. I guess we can cling to that to discuss the turning back of time and uh, other issues uh, that are actually happening. Uh, joining me from an extremely safe distance in safely distant parts of California, Baratunde Thurston and Nato Green. Hello. Hello, Andy. Welcome back, Baratunde. It's great to have you uh, have you back back on the show. Great to be back. Great to be here with the great Nato Green. What's up, Nato? Uh, hello, Bartunde. Hello, Andy. Hello, Buglers. Shalom, all. Uh, Nato, you were saying you've been, you've been ill. Yeah, it's, yeah. since my last appearance on the Bugle, I got sick. I might have had COVID. Don't know. I, I, so I tested negative, had, had a fever for six days, and I was told to self-isolate until 72 hours after the end of the sim- symptoms. Uh, I don't know if you've had a COVID test, but the way that you do it here is that you drive into a parking lot outside the hospital and a small but incredibly powerful Filipina nurse in full protective garb uh, takes a swab. And I'm not that good at uh, estimating distance, but my educated guess is that it was about four meters long. Um, <laughs> and she takes the swab and uh, and grabs me firmly by the back of the neck like I'm a misbehaving dog who needs to be shown the bad thing he did by shitting on the baby and inserts the swab into my nostril and then straight back. Uh, I didn't. I knew that you could go up your nostril, but not straight back. I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> and, but she held my head so that I couldn't pull away and jam the swab straight back into my head. Uh, and it hurt so much that I peed a little and started confessing to crimes I never committed. Um, I told her where the bombs were planted. I told her how to find Bin Laden. All the all the things. Um, and so then I was sealed off in a room in my house. Uh, and my wife just left food on the, on the floor, uh, outside my room. And <laughs> so, uh, like we, dog. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we, we cosplayed like I was, I was in solitary confinement for smuggling rhubarb pie into the prison yard and she was going to throw me in the hole until I crack and <laughs> snitch on the rest of the pie sn- smuggling syndicate. Uh, so it's hard. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a weird experience cause it's like. I was sick for a week with a fever and, and, and wondering if I was about to die. And either I had a false negative and I did have COVID or I just had a cold and I'm a whiny wimp. And uh, <laughs> doctors don't know. Doctors don't right. diagnose as pending. Well, I mean, that's the thing that I mean, the people have been trying to find a vaccination for being, uh, you know, a, a whining wimp for, for centuries, millennia even. And millennia, it, it does, yeah. yeah. It doesn't appear that we're any closer to it. Uh, Baratton, how are things in, uh, in Los Angeles? Uh, things are good down here. I'm safer at home, which is the language of my mayor. And I think NATO and I shared governor as opposed to shelter in place as if there were armed gunmen running on the loose, which of course there are because it's America, but not <laughs> above average in the other way. And uh, unlike NATO, I'm not going to plead COVID sympathy. Uh, I probably had it, but I don't want to talk about it or like kind of create this whole narrative like I'm really tough and I stuck it out. And yeah, I got swabbed too, but you don't hear me like making up a whole thing. I just did my civic duty and (laughs) shut up uh, about it. So, yeah, I'm good. I'm here with my fiance. We are so grateful that we moved from New York City uh, last year, knowing this was coming, but not telling anyone because it would ruin the real estate market. And uh, yeah, I I feel pretty lucky, all all things considered, uh, both about like my specific home situation and my like political home situation to be in the capital of the Western Pacific Federated States of America <laughs> is just really lucky. Like I could have ended up somewhere else and, and a lot worse things to be happening. Well, I made uh, a surprisingly um, competent curry this week, so it's been a, a huge, hugely productive <laughs> time for me. W- what kind of curry was it, Andy? Uh, it was a uh, paneer tikka masala. Um, oh. Yeah. And, um, so very British of you. <laughs> yeah, uh, as British as it's possible. Classic to get. British dish. Just uh, did, did, culinary did you, appropriation of the highest <laughs> order. <laughs> uh, did did you did you cook it by walking over to your neighbor's house and planting a flag on their food? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, 
I mean, it's a, it's a, we, we cannot abandon everything that has made this country great. <laughs> <laughs> it is a time of change, but you don't throw all the babies out with all the bathwater. You gotta, you gotta maintain those core values in exactly. times of rapid change. I guess. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are recording on the 8th of May, 2020. Um, and it, we're ha- celebrating 75 years since VE Day victory in Europe, the end of the uh, Second World War, European phase, wild celebrations as the world uh, finally cured itself of the disease of Nazism and left itself with Im- an immunity to more world wars, although, the, of course, the reichectomy surgery did leave deep scarring and took a considerable time to recover from it. So- sorry, I know it really irritates people using med- medical analogies to describe a war, but yeah, that's just, just the way things go. Uh, also today is World Donkey Day. Um, I don't know how you guys are celebrating World Donkey Day, the uh, 8th, uh, 8th of May. Um, have, you, have you ridden a donkey anywhere or not? Just going just to try to make an ass of myself today, Andy. <laughs> Boom, there we go. There we go. We're Welcome in it now. Back. Welcome back. <laughs> um, uh, I've well, just don- been shouting, it's on like Donkey Kong at my children all morning. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, of course, we all bang on about the combustion engine, powered flight, the internet, the lie, the conspiracy theory, and cricket as the greatest inventions in history. But what about the donkey? On World Donkey Day, we celebrate the contribution of donkeys to human civilization. Uh, great donkey moments of history, such as when uh, Jesus, the renowned donkey stunt rider, performed the first ever loop the loop on his donkey. Pedro Plod was his name when he clopped the beast off uh, the top of the uh, Tower of the Temple in Jerusalem. Uh, of course, the uh, celebrity Spanish writer Miguel de Cervantes penned a heartrending tale about a donkey's brush with death after the hungry animal accidentally ate a bag of what it thought was sugar but was in fact heroin in his masterwork, Donkey O.D. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm literally here all year in, in, this, in this shed. <laughs> Top story this week. Uh, it's getting biblical. The plagues are coming upon us. It was uh, it's always inevitable, I guess, that uh, the old biblical plagues that proved so effective back in the day um, uh, would uh, would make a comeback. And um, uh, well, NATO um, as a as a fellow Jew, obviously, um, we know quite how effective uh, biblical plagues can be um, in terms of uh, you, know, you know sort of political. Um, progress. Um, uh, you are our uh, biblical plague correspondent. Uh, just bring us up to date with uh, the latest plague that's been affecting uh, affecting America. That's right, Andy. So the first thing we should acknowledge is that uh, the last time I was on the Bugle was around the Jewish holiday of Passover, which uh, celebrates the story of the Exodus, which is uh, uh, whence the plagues come. And I and I wrote a bit a bit of business about of some plague jokes that Chris cut from the show <laughs> and. Uh, and I want to. I just want to take a moment to to acknowledge <laughs> that the onward march of time uh, has proven me right and Chris wrong. Um, <laughs> so, and has required us to bring back the plague jokes that got cut for time uh, last time. Uh, so, you know, the, the these these in in religion you have the these stories that last last across thousands of years because of the enduring symbolism and metaphors. Um, and they and they continue to teach us, and they reach across centuries to teach us and inspire us. For example, these bl- biblical plagues from the book of Exodus, in which the Jewish people need to stay in the house to avoid a plague. And those kind of metaphors uh, are really powerful today. Uh, in the book of Pla- in the book of Exodus, there are ten plagues sent by God to punish the Egyptians for enslaving the Jews. Uh, in this case, we started at the angel of death. Uh, and, which makes the other, the previous nine plagues seem kind of not that bad. Like <laughs> uh, rivers of blood seems kind of okay. Frogs, I could take that. Uh, cattle disease was one of the biblical plagues. Uh, we should all give up beef anyway because of climate change. But so COVID is the angel of death plague. And then God, in her ineffable, ineffable wisdom, said, crap. I shot my wad at plague number 10. I should have started out at a smaller plague and then worked my way up. Uh, you know what I mean? Like I should have started out with a lesser plague, like not being able to get the song Bittersweet Symphony out of your head uh, and then worked my way up gradually to the pandemic. Like if you start out at 10, you have nowhere to go. Yeah. So God had to back it up a little bit. And so here we are with murder hornets uh, is the next biblical plague that we're facing in the United States is a species of hornet that appeared in the uh, Pacific Northwest capable of killing a human. Murder hornets are originally come from Chinese sweatshops like the coronavirus and MAGA hats. Um, 
<laughs> and the murder hornets are are so named for their slaughter phase in which they find honeybees decapitate them and then feed the bodies to their their young and that's how you know that they're a cruel and destructive species because a more humane murder hornet would eat the entire honeybee and not waste the head uh <laughs> Everyone knows that honeybee cheeks are a delicacy. Um, uh, murder hornets have a distinctive look. They're quite large. They're about the size of a matchbox. Uh, they're described as having large yellow-orange heads, prominent black eyes, and a black and yellow striped ab- abdomen. And their children are named Eric, Donald Jr., Ivanka, and Baron. But they only love Ivanka. I'm sorry. That, that joke was beneath all of us. Um, so, uh, Angel of Death, check. Murder hornets, check. What else you got? Earth. Gargantuan f***ing hailstones. Uh, there's hail now that's been spotted that is uh, six to nine inches across. The biggest one seen of the gargantuan hailstone was in Argentina, but there's also gargantuan hailstones turned up in the Dakotas. They can sh- shatter car window. Anything else? Gypsy moth infestations, which can, which can destroy the entire food supply. The gypsy moths uh, is the more politically correct name of that type of moth that were previously called the queer kike moths. Uh, <laughs> But uh, it's been the name has been modernized uh, to be more politically correct. Anyway, so now we've, we're at four. We're at four of the ten plagues. We've got plagues, hornet tail, moth, moths. Uh, I am crying, Uncle. I don't know about you, but I think Trump should let the Israelites go. Like it's, I get the message, and in this version of the story, Trump is Pharaoh. Israelites are anyone who doesn't watch Fox News, and go means not die. <laughs> Well, it's so uh, exciting times for, uh, for 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 Bible Bible fans. Um, murder hornets, uh, as you say, also known as the Asian giant hornets. Um, there is no evidence that they were created in a laboratory researching insect warfare by Chinese Han Dynasty Emperor Yuan Di in the first century uh, BC. We don't know that, but no smoke without fire. Um, Trump's advice: um, if you've been stung by a giant hornet, um, you could be able to cure yourself by swallowing an agricultural pesticide or hitting yourself repeatedly with a badminton racket or other swatting device or releasing swarms of giant hornets so more people get stung thus accelerating the chase for a hornet vaccine um uh baratunde have you you ever come across a murder hornet in your uh in your travels yeah i I call them police but uh you know each we have different languages even though we both speak english i'm not sure how you refer to them over there uh no i have not come across this particular breed and I thought it was, it, it actually gave me sympathy briefly for, I was like, maybe immigrants are bad. Like, it just it just crossed my mind. <laughs> and I was like, man, this is like a really, I'm in a bad place right now. Because <laughs> I'm like, well, they're, they don't just call them murder hornets. They're like Asian. You know, they're Asian murder. So they have to add this like other label on them. And I'm sure that like does something deep within our psyche to just avoid those people and blame them for those things. Um, but otherwise, I, I feel pretty lucky to be among the last humans to experience this planet. That's pretty exciting. <laughs> uh, if you've never seen a murder hornet uh, bugler, picture uh, a regular bee or a wasp that has been crossbred with uh, someone who makes outright YouTube videos in uh, in their bedroom. Uh, they basically look like that, overconfident, angry, and disconcertingly unhuman. Um, <laughs> They're, uh, they're the world's biggest hornet, no less, the size of a matchbox, unless you get really long uh, matches. But um, uh, considerably le- less useful and well-behaved than matchboxes, uh, they all, uh, also, if you, if you find the matchbox not a useful size comparison, they're one millionth the size of a football pitch, if uh, that is the reference uh, of size that you prefer uh, to use. Uh, Andy, could you tell us how, how big they are re- relative to, uh, to a, qu- a cricket bat? A cricket bat? Um, oh, I'm not. I'd, ha- I'd have to do the calculations on that, but I imagine you could probably, if you froze murder hornets, uh, I'm guessing probably about 400 murder hornets per bat. But I'm not sure. Andy, I'll give give me the experiment. give me the length of the hornet, and I'll the come back to you with a stat in a little while. Well, it's about it's about two inches long. The murder hornet. Um, well, it's I ma- love so it's this matchbox. real-time research. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ma- it's matchbox length, Chris. But I'm assuming well, it's could, a little, I, little could, match. Yeah. Could I modify the research assignment, Chris? Yeah. Um, so what, what I'm interested in is not just a sort of length comparison, but actually a volume comparison. So essentially how many murder hornets to combine uh, to replace uh, a cricket bat. That's that's more interesting to me. Yeah. Leave it with and me. W- I mean, would, it, would it actually be useful as a cricket bat? I'm, I'm going to get the fielders away from, from, 
from around you. Anyway, the well, you use the honey from all the dead bees to glue them together. Yeah. But I mean, we're, we're, we're making progress here as a species. I can feel this. We're um, trying to survive. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, uh, as you were saying, Nato, the, the MO of the murder hornet is uh, to invade uh, a beehive, decapitate the bees, take their mangled corpses back home to feed their hornet kids. No wonder they grow up to be such bastards. It shows the importance of responsible parenting. They then put the dead bees' heads on spikes, pour on Courage les autres, hold show trials of any surviving bees to sow further despair in the oppressed bee community, then douse the hive in kerosene and casually set it on fire by flicking one of the matches they keep in their own bodies over their shoulder whilst mouthing you next to an ant's nest. In summary, these things do not f*** about. <laughs> Uh, the, the hail, I mean, hail has been a go-to play for deities uh, the universe over, really, since the, since the idea of plagues uh, began. And it's an absolute belter, really, as uh, meteorological signs of divine anger go. Terrifying, visually spectacular, umbrella-ruining, and can make a real dent on a sinful individual's car. And, uh, um, yeah, the biggest hailstone uh, in... Yeah, as you said, it fell in Argentina back in... Um, back in 2018 and on tuesday they had hailstones the size of cantaloupe melons in south dakota admittedly only very small cantaloupe melons the size of golf balls but still um uh, it, I, basically i think the signs are lock up your firstborns essentially yeah buglers if there is a message from this show lock up your firstborn it's also it seems to me that we're in the phase of earth's unsubtle messaging to humanity like we've been there's been an attempt to communicate with us that maybe we've overstepped our bounds a little bit. And so you lower the air quality, slowly increase the acidification of the rains <laughs> and the waters, very minusculely every year raise the sea level. And now Mother Earth is just like, I'm bombing you with ice. <laughs> like that's apparently you've not picked up on these memos I've been dropping for the past couple hundred years. So murder hornets and, and ice bombs. Uh, and it's it's it, as if no one saw the documentary The Happening starring Mark Wahlberg <laughs> in, in which the earth tries to make humans kill themselves to stop destroying the earth. Uh, the moths in uh, in Washington state um which is, was also the recipient of the uh, the murder hornets. Um yeah. well, it does slightly suggest that God like so many people around the world mistake Washington DC and Washington state <laughs> as the same thing uh, which I, I guess is is uh, easy to do. Washington State's trees are reportedly deeply concerned but refusing to move. A spokespine for all trees in the state said that's just what the moths would want us to do. We will not give up our way of life. Given the, the suffering that Washington State is going for, I, I do have to uh, leer suspiciously at Canada as a possible source of this right. uh, and the misdirecting with the anti-Asian rhetoric, but really we don't know and these both striking Washington State puts a lot of suspicion on them. Right. And this is, uh, what, was it, um, what was that 19th century election that came down to basically warmongering with, uh, regarding the West Coast states and Canada? Are, are you talking about the, uh, uh, possibly the presidential election of 1844, in which James K. Polk yes, ran, ran for it. office yeah. and said, I'm going to do three things in one term, and then I'm not going to run for president again. And those three things are Texas, California, and Oregon. Right. And then he, he was elected, did those three things through, through war, war and plunder, and then left office and dropped dead a month later. <laughs> that is the kind of political efficiency that we need today. <laughs> talk, about, talk about term limits, my goodness. Right. Talk, talk, talk about a, a politician not lying on the campaign trail. Exactly. Um, well, just looking at uh, you know, other potential plagues, I mean, there has been uh, locust problems in in Africa reported on the BBC uh, this week. There was a plague of darkness in the Bible, um, uh, a, you know, metaphorical darkness. I think that's already in uh, in full swing. And the water changing to blood. I mean, that's. Um, could well happen in Britain. We'll know when uh, Health Secretary Matt Hancock announced that the government has achieved a record amount of blood donations as per its targets, but only by squirting some red food, food colouring into tanks of water, uh, which is essentially the way the government meets most of its targets these days. There are other things that could be signs of biblical vengeance. Um, uh, internet speeds too slow to stream films in HD. Um, that's uh, that's I mean, that's probably seventy two percent likely to be divine punishment, uh, and no sport. I mean, the, the plague of sportlessness, I think, is probably the the toughest thing humanity's ever. I mean, I am as atheistic as a sausage, but even I can tell when the Almighty is not all righty. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
American news now, and um, uh, Donald Trump, your um, uh, spiritual leader and overlord, um, hacked into the Lincoln Memorial this week <laughs> uh, to do a virtual town hall interview, um, stroke embarrass himself, his office, his country, his gender and his species, delete according to political affiliation and or grasp on, uh, on reality. Um, he sat beneath the feet of the Lincoln statue, which features a 28-foot tall version of the already 6-foot, 5-inch, four-time All-American stovepipe wearer of the year and celebrity assassination victim. Uh, about 20 minutes into the interview, a strange look came across uh, Abraham Lincoln's uh, big marble face. There was a twitching of the cheek, a furrowing of his marble brow, a twitching of his famous whiskers, and then, unless my eyes deceive me, a trickle of urine down his marble leg. Now, we've heard of statues of the Virgin Mary crying tears of blood, or indeed tears of tears well here was a statue passing liquid judgment on the man who laughably occupies the office that abraham lincoln himself once uh, once held um how did you guys uh, feel about this, uh, this this latest installment in trump's um, unique uh, four-year performance art piece i think uh, the current president um has been doing his best to live up to the historic achievements uh, of abraham lincoln <clears throat> Uh, Lincoln was president, of course, during the Civil War, which saw the deaths of over 700,000 uh, American soldiers. And I think this president is working his way up to that number uh, as quickly uh, as possible. And so to be seen in the same light uh, as that president, obviously a little smaller, but uh, he, he's well on his way to, to being, you know, a great statesman and a, and a great mass murderer uh, of American people. That's as, as close as I could get to understanding why the hell that would be allowed to happen other than you know, cult-like um, obligation on the part of the uh, media that supported it. Well, they're also both n known for their great oratory. Uh, you know, Lincoln f uh, said, you know, four score and seven years ago, our forefathers embarked on building a new nation. And Trump said, have you thought about injecting yourself with disinfectant? <laughs> so uh, those are both, you know, historic speeches that will be mm -hmm. studied by students of uh, American civics for, for generations to come. Well, sorry, NATO correction, generation, singular. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not look too far The, the last remaining generation. <laughs> um, and what else do the two men uh, have uh, in, in common? Um, I guess the fact that both would be completely appalled by the other's version of the Republican Party. And uh, both paid hush money to a porn star. Um, actually, no, Link, it wasn't quite that with Lincoln, was it? I, I can't. It, definitely both had something to do with getting in trouble with an actor, uh, but I can't remember exactly <laughs> exactly what was. But um, the uh, Fox News interviewers tore into him like a dead kitten uh, into a nuclear bunker, and um, Trump basically trumped it up as only Trump can with a cocktail of delusionist fantasy um, that sort to take people's attention away from the fact that he doesn't quite have the courage to go around his country killing people with his own bare hands yet but do not rule it out depending on how the polls are looking in september to october listen i i, I had a thought um which happens uh, a couple times a week and in this case i was thinking about the uh the, the willing sacrifice of so many americans by our current leader and how that didn't have to be the case and how he actually could have made a lot of money off of supporting uh, life by having MAGA masks and selling them through the White House store, big red flaming blood masks yep. uh, that all his followers could wear to prove that they support evil um, for a price and obviously made in China uh, for you know, fair trade, but <laughs> missed opportunity to make money and uh, make people not die. It's a, it's a real shame. <laughs> Uh, I, I feel personally, uh, s tragically, vindicated by what's unfolded because Trump and a lot of the right wing has been calling for the reopening of the country. And last month I came on the Bugle and I told you all, I said, don't get carried away publicizing this thing about how COVID disproportionately kills black people because then the right wing will get excited about COVID. <laughs> uh, and sure enough... They got excited about COVID and wanted to reopen the economy. I regret to inform you that the whites are at it again. Uh, they want they want the restrictions lifted so they can simultaneously let black and brown people die while still maintaining enough black and brown people to pick their vegetables and butcher their chickens and deliver food and do everything else that keeps the economy going. They want to have their cake and eat it too. And by cake in this context, I mean ethnic cleansing. Uh, <laughs> But the most horrifying implication of this is that now is that I said something on the bugle that then 
became true. Right. Uh, and the idea that the bugle is actually a source of prophecy and predictive power. Yeah. Uh, let that sink in for a minute. Think about right. all the bullshit spewed on this podcast and then the chaos that will ensue when it <laughs> definitely comes true in the future. Get ready for the long-awaited Kim Jong-un versus Prince Charles snooker match. Uh <laughs> <laughs> that is what is going to happen now. And he did actually uh, <laughs> predict the bleach three weeks before Trump said it as well, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even remember that. I think I've, um, yeah. Well, I mean, that often happens when Jewish people start saying and writing things that um, you know, they, they just come true. You know? Just can't help it. Um, so these are uh, the anti-lockdown protests or pro-death protests, whichever you want to call them. And ironically, mm. that you know, a lot of the same people also pro-life, um, uh, pro-life and pro-death. It's a bizarre. I'm mean, pro-life until it's out of the womb, essentially. Then fuck it, it can uh, take its own chances. Um, uh, but I mean, it's kind of curious, um, kind of uh, degree of organised idiocy, isn't it? Or is this just what we've come to expect? Yeah, so the anti-lockdown protests have swept the nations. Uh, uh, people are showing up on, in mass and also in mass to defy quarantine and defend their God-given right to infect one another and die. Uh, this right is a hallowed American tradition deep in our national DNA. When President Roosevelt gave the Four Freedoms speech in 1941, he talked about it quite explicitly. The Four Freedoms, of course, were freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. And the anti-lockdown protesters are carrying those freedoms forward today. They're speaking up for their freedom to worship guns and stupidity in order to be free from wanting a functioning respiratory system. And they are free of fear. Uh, you don't need masks or tests or vaccines. The vaccine can only get you sick if you fear it. Uh, that's uh, based on the latest medical research from the Jackass School of Medicine. Um, now... People often think that the American right wing is sort of a monolithic blob of ignorant white people, but it's actually quite diverse. And among the anti-lockdown protesters, you see libertarians, gun enthusiasts, white supremacists, and anti-vaxxers. Um, <laughs> the full gamut of the, the full yeah, it's diversity. Called, it's called diversity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Our armed white supremacists and anti-vaxxers was the winning combination the world didn't know it needed. Uh, they go together like projectile vomiting and flesh-eating strep, like the Spanish Inquisition and slam poetry, like Charles Manson and America's Got Talent, like a raging rock-hard erection in your grandma's funeral uh, is how, how do armed you white know? supremacists and anti-vaxxers you know go together. <laughs> <laughs> the hard way. <laughs> oh, wow. The um, the thing I've been struck by with the anti-lockdown protests is the severe overlap of the all lives matter counter protesters to black lives matter with uh, and the blue lives matter. So you take all lives matter, blue lives matter. And then you get a bunch of people screaming without masks in the faces of police officers on the steps of the state capitals <laughs> of this country. And it just I don't, maybe it's just me, but I'm thinking maybe they didn't mean it when they said all lives matter i don't know i'm just gonna put that out there it bears further investigation again i'll put it in the chris skinner research pile and uh if you can get back to us by the end of the show um uh, with the murder hornet ratio and uh, did the all lives matter community really mean all lives that'll be very helpful to us i think they meant no lives matter mm. it's very th th it's it's one of those tricky things it could be zero or infinity either one right right <laughs> Uh, one man who's also not been happy with the lockdown is uh, Elon Musk, the obviously fictitious uh, techtrepreneur, um, who has been tweeting some curious things of late. Um, he described the uh, Bay Area's extension of stay-at-home orders as fascist. This is not democratic. He tweeted, this is not freedom. Give people back their goddamn freedom. He'd also tweeted that Tesla shares were overpriced, leading to a 10% slump in uh, the company's um, value and shareholders begging him to build himself a social media proof nonsense tight space pod where he can vent his muskings without having uh, without anyone else having to hear them. Uh, the stock, of course, recovered the next day, proving that stock markets remain the bedwetting morality vacuums that they were before lockdown. So at least there is some comforting normality in these, um, these difficult times. He's still set for a a $700 million payout. Uh, Musk, that's the equivalent value of 700 bottles of hand sanitizer at current market rate. Um, and this is despite <laughs> the fact that Tesla is currently making no cars at all. I don't see that as a problem, though, because the thing with Musk is that, I mean, he is obviously entirely fictitious as a human being. So if his company then becomes fictitious in the sense that it's not making anything, is that not an entirely appropriate logical endpoint of Muskism as a commercial uh, philosophy? I, I think Elon Musk, you know, in the spirit of kind of biblical and prophetic 
uh, meanderings we've had on this episode so far. He, to me, is a clear sign that despite all of the progress we've made as a society, women can wear pants now. Um, black people can whistle. There's uh, so many new freedoms. Uh, a white guy can still do pretty much anything he wants in this society <laughs> and get overcompensated. <laughs> he can try his damnedest to get thrown out of the club and he's got permanent VIP status inside the champagne room. <laughs> there is nothing this man can do that will get him removed. And that is the ultimate value of Elon Musk, just to humble us all before the great truth <laughs> of white supremacy. E Elon Musk is a, is, a, is a poster child of how unfettered capitalist greed rots your humanity and makes you into a shell of a real human being. He's sort of become a profiteering Elon Husk. Am I right? <laughs> That was for some reason that one broke me. I don't know why. I was I was rolling with all of this for the past forty minutes. I feel like then... it would have been funnier if Tom Ballard had said it. <laughs> I think I have that as it, a review. It, it does one of my seem, live shows. <clears throat> it seems curious to me. Like, is Elon trying to get to Mars, or is he trying to convince all of us to go there without him? <laughs> That's a big uh, question. Uh, it, it, at the same time, while all this is happening, while Elon Musk uh, crashed his stock and then it recovered it and stopped making cars, Elon Musk and his partner Grimes had a baby, uh, a baby boy, and the baby's name is spelled X A E mashed together A twelve Musk. And let me unpack that name for you for a second. <laughs> uh, this is how Grimes explained it: X is the unknown variable. Solve for X. The A E is the elven spelling of artificial intelligence, uh, which, of course, sets up that long-awaited Legolas ter Terminator crossover buddy flick we've all been waiting for. <laughs> and the A12 is the precursor to the SR-17, which is Elon Musk and Grimes favorite aircraft. Uh, this raises the question, how rich is too rich? Uh, when do you cross the line from market incentives inspiring innovation and entrepreneurship into decadence and madness? I'd say that line might be the point at which you have a favorite aircraft. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that, that might be too Are you sure it's not he, when you have a favorite aircraft and name your child after it? Is that not the, the yeah. second favorite? In part. In part. In part. But I should, should also say that um, yeah, the, the child's full name is XAA12 Musk, but it is known as XAA Twee for short. So um, it, it gets worse. Appar but, I've been told, I did some investigation, apparently that name is actually supposed to be pronounced, do you know this? No. Kyle. Uh, <laughs> because so here's how it works. No, the, no, the, stop. The no. X is the is the Greek uh, Greek for Chi, as right. in like Chi, Beta, like whatever. Sigma Chi. Yeah. yeah. A E is 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 pr is pronounced A I, as in yep. the A I of Kyle, the Y, yeah, like Chi. Yeah. The, right. The and uh, the A twelve is the twelfth letter of the alphabet, uh, which is L. Right. And never in the history of humanity has spelling X A E A twelve A as Kyle. Uh, nothing has ever been so simultaneously so pretentious and so lame at the same time. Uh, it would be like when Prince Nate changed his name to the symbol to get out of that record deal, and while the symbol visually uh, combined the symbols for male and female, he had announced uh, that it was actually pronounced Dongmeister. Uh, that is how stupid this is. <laughs> quick bit of Britain news now. Uh, things still not going too well here uh, in Britain um, as we uh, rocket to the top of the European Fatality League. Um, a lot of um, a lot of news about this uh, consignment of um, protective equipment that um, we bought from some dodgy backstreet dealer in Turkey and the flight was delayed and then it's turned up with 400,000 protective gowns that have been described by officials as absolutely useless uh, and uh, the shipment is now due to be uh, flown back um, earlier uh, well last weekend the government claimed it's reached it has reached its target of 100,000 tests a day by the end of April it achieved this target for two days and the, that number has now dropped down again and it only achieved the target by counting test kits that have been sent out in the post regardless of whether or not they had then actually been used for tests and some of which had no return envelope so people who rang the helpline say what do i do with this were told to just throw it away so this is basically the government what, what it might as well do is just claim that the death figures are nowhere near as bad by sitting next to a corpse waving its arm around saying look he's saying hello 
Um, but, you know, these it, are it strange... Makes you, it makes you miss Brexit jokes, doesn't it, Andy? Oh, God, yes. Bring, bring... <laughs> I never thought I'd say this, but just bring Brexit back. <laughs> You're pursuing a different sort of Brexit now. <laughs> Slower, but more permanent. Yes, yeah. Yeah, just the slow death of all hope and happiness. And people. Yeah, exactly. I mean, which is pretty much the subtext of real Brexit. <laughs> yes. I, I, I have to admit, when I... Uh, got to the British section of our news stories, I, I started to experience an emotion that I hadn't felt in a while, which was happiness. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I felt less alone. Right. And I had been so focused on my own government's yeah. failures at the national level that it never occurred to me that there were yet more incompetent leaders left yes. uh, in the modern world to join us. Yeah. And, and so I say welcome uh, this end of the pool is filled with blood, but it's uh, it's nice, it's comfy, yep. and it's so good to have you. You have no idea the service you're providing Thank to you. Americans by being shitty yourselves <laughs> with the personal protective equipment. Well, that, um, that pool being full of blood, there, there you go. There's our water turning into blood plague. <laughs> <to go. laughs> well, that, we are approaching the end of, uh, of this week's video. Well, Chris, you had a couple of statistical queries that you've been uh, busy uh, researching. Yeah, I've, I've rounded up in places, so right, okay. apologies. Um, but uh, basically, so two inches is the typical uh, Queen murder hornet's length. Cricket bat, blade only, I'm not counting handle. Right. Uh, it's 38 inches, so that's basically 19 head to stinger. Yeah. But the blade is 38 inches by 4.25. Yeah. Um, now, I, I went for an open wingspan because that looks more dynamic. Right. So 7.6 centimetres, yeah. which is about three inches. Yeah. So if you tore some in half as, <laughs> as close as you could, right. <laughs> you could get 27 across the blade of a bat right. with their beautiful, fully flexed wings. Now, the depth of the bat yeah. is a maximum of 2.6 inches. So if you yeah. went for the full depth of the bat across, right. you could get the hornets too deep throughout that whole bat. Right. So uncrushed, but with many cut in half, yeah. you can fit 54. So that's the volume of a bat holds 54 of the murder hornets. But with wings spread? But with wings spread, right. yeah, because I thought that looked better. But what and, yeah, about you've got to allow a bit of a flourish. What if they're all huddled together then? Well, just shitloads would be the right. answer. Because um, <laughs> the thing is, if you're gonna if you're gonna have them spaced out with wings spread, obviously you get a lighter bat, so that yeah, supports you know, a more wristy player uh, who likes a kind of touch player. But if you want more power in your in your hornet bat, then you're going to want them crushed together, but a bit heavier. But you'll have more hornets, a bit more sting in your shot, so to speak. Well, I went for the average bat of 1.3 kilos, which right. is in the half. What's that about? About two nine, two ten yeah. uh, in our money. Yeah. And um, so, it, it, interestingly, on that, the um, in, if you want to talk about the venom, the weight of the venom right. in in each individual one of these hornets is four milligrams per kilo. Right. Which is, whilst it's not the most toxic venom, it's the highest volume of venom right. per hornet, wasp, or bee. Right. Which means each cricket bat would contain five point four milligrams of hornet venom. Right. Okay. <laughs> Someday it is possible that sport will resume in the world. I want nothing more in this universe than for Andy to say to another announcer and commentator, you know, the cricket bat is equivalent to 54 murder, murder hornets. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chris, carry on. Oh, just the, the, the final one. I was asked about uh, the All Lives Matter community, which uh, uh, ultimately uh, we know they have the collective empathy of the volume of venom of less than one inside edge of one cricket bat. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for listening, Bugles. I'm, I'm glad we managed to bring some uh, some illuminating facts to this uh, this this episode. Um, just before we go, the latest uh, on what does definitely not cure the virus. There have been a lot of uh, kind of wacky theories about what does cure the virus. We at the Bugle like to balance that out by telling you definitely what does not cure it. Uh, playing water polo without a hat on, no use whatsoever. Covering your face and neck with peanut butter also of no real help uh, against the virus screaming whenever you see another person could help in terms of social distancing but has no actual medic uh, medicinal value burying a set of golf clubs in a public park with bloodstains on uh, that doesn't help um, or indeed uh, just wanting it to go away uh, also of no use whatsoever so do spread those 
definite facts about the virus. Um, Baratunde, uh, thanks so much. It's been so delightful to have you uh, have you back on the show for for the. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, do come uh, come back again. Do you have any other um, shows or uh, anything you'd like to alert our listeners? Yeah, to? so I'm I'm doing a live show twice a week at least. Um, it's called Live on Lockdown, and it's Thursdays on Instagram Live. Uh, Sundays are probably the timings that that folks in the UK could tune in best. That is 3 p.m. Pacific, which is 6 p.m. Eastern, which is uh, at a, a particular time in the United yeah, Kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but at any rate, all, all of those are discoverable at baratunde.com slash live. I'm adding things and I put out uh, two email newsletters per week with some entertainment, some some definite facts, to use your language, uh, and then some of my perspectives. So uh, find me, like everyone else, in the cloud. Nighto. Uh, I, I have a couple comedy albums out uh, that you can you can pick up the NATO Green Party and the Whiteness album, uh, Mr. NATO Green on Instagram, NATO Green uh, on Twitter. Follow follow me on Twitter uh, if you c- come come for jokes and stay for unfunny and deeply technical analysis of public health policy. <laughs> <laughs> It's quite that, a sales pitch. That yeah. is the Sold. best poster slogan I've ever heard. Yeah, <laughs> the, 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 the way that Andy uh, can bore any non-sport fan to tears with innumerable cricket stats, I can do that with the details of, uh, of hospital planning policy. <laughs> and will do so. <laughs> Next Saturday, Buglers, we will have the first Lockdown Live Bugle. Uh, which will be... Uh, do we know what time yet, Chris? Uh, I suggested 8. You thought 9 might be better. I don't think All we right. reached a conclusion. All right. Well, 8 p.m. stroke 9 p.m. British time, so it'll be early morning New Zealand-Australia time, mid-afternoon or lunchtime uh, on the Pacific side of the USA, mid-afternoon on the uh, east side. Oh, I don't know if we've got that many listeners in between, uh, but, uh, you know... Uh, you never know uh, anyway so that's it it'll be a live uh, live streamed bugle uh, featuring me Alice and Nish um, and uh, do tune in uh, tune in uh, for, for that to see how our technical expertise uh, stands up to, to that challenge um, thank you very much uh, for listening until then goodbye and we will play you out as always with some lies about our premium level voluntary subscribers Suzanne Wheatley thinks that if telephone inventing superstar Alexander Graham Bell were alive today, rather than in the late 19th and early 20th century, and if the telephone had instead been invented by Bell's great rival, Harding J. Tinkle, then Bell would invent a communications device that enables the living to have video calls with the dead. Suzanne explains, His family all lived ages ago, and have long since carked it, so I reckon Bell would invent something to keep in touch with them. Phil Shoebridge is much taken with this idea, and despite being no relation of ancient King Nebuchadnezzar II, would like to invite the much-criticised Bible-era celebrity round to his house for dinner. Phil explains, I reckon he'd be very talkative. After all, he really could babble on. Yes, Phil also wonders whether Nebuchadnezzar's full name was in fact Nebuchadnezzeltine, but it was shortened, as happened to the former British politician Michael Hezer Heseltine. Johann Bengston was the first person ever to make a sandwich involving avocado, Emmental cheese, smoked mackerel, garlic mayonnaise, watercress, plum tomatoes, shallots, playing cards, a pair of binoculars, Factor 30 sun cream, a compass, a roadmap and a spare hat. That's the last time I just chuck my packed lunch in the same bag as everything else when I go for a long walk in the countryside, remembers Johann, who also claims the sandwich was surprisingly edible, if not, quotes, entirely tasty. On the subject of sandwiches, Alexis Irvin once did some experimental cookery using office stationery. I used a hole punch and made a ring binder file using toasted fajitas as the covers and onion ringlets as the bindery bits, explains Alexis. I then served slices of bacon, lettuce, blue cheese, tomato and portobello mushroom, each with holes punched so they could be filed according to the order in which the sandwich eater wanted them. I was that sandwich eater and it was absolutely delicious. Alexis was forbidden from using the hole punch and vowed never to work in an office again. Here endeth this week's lies. To join them or support the Bugle Podcast in whatever way you can, go to thebuglepodcast.com and click the donate button. Don't forget, Bugle Live next Saturday night, stroke afternoon, stroke next Sunday morning, depending on when you are. It will be on our YouTube channel, which I am reliably informed does exist. Details to follow on the Twitter feed, Facebook and website. See you all then. <laughs>